This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Yemeni news agency Sabah said that clashes have erupted between government forces and Houthi rebels in Sada in the north. A government source confirmed that 11 rebels were killed during battles. At the same time, the Houthi rebels published images of what they claimed to be burned military vehicles, as well as government soldiers who surrendered, in Harf Sufyan in Amran province. These clashes took place despite news reports that a ceasefire was going to be made in Sada in order to allow relief supplies to get in. Three weeks have passed since the ongoing battles between the army and Houthi rebels started in Sa'ada, but neither of the two sides has been able to overpower the other. According to sources from the Yemeni military, the army has destroyed Houthi strongholds and killed 11 rebels. Meanwhile, fighting continues between the army and rebels in the old city of Sa'ada. According to the same source, army and security units have managed to destroy a number of Houthi strongholds north of Manzala, Hamzat and Mansur, as well as a car carrying weapons in al-Manzala. The same military source revealed that the army and security units also managed to take control of five locations in Zu Suleiman, where one of the Houthi leaders, Saled Swedan, is located. The source pointed out that the army and security forces shelled Houthi locations in Al-Mashtal, Al-End, and Sembal, causing the rebels heavy losses, especially in the Damak area. Meanwhile, the independent Yemen news website confirmed that intense gunfire exchange is taking place in the central market in the old city of Sa'ada. Amidst these developments, the suffering of people who have been displaced is increasing. According to the United Nations, 150,000 displaced people have lost their homes and are in need of help. The UN Refugee Agency called on both sides to stop the fighting. Also, the World Food Program said that it was only able to provide 10,000 displaced people with food left. Last month, Ramzi Al Masri, Al Arabiya. Joining us from Sanaa is my colleague Hamoud Manasser. What are the latest developments pertaining to the clashes that erupted in Sada? Does this mean that the unofficial ceasefire, as you call it, has collapsed? Of course, the fighting has not stopped. The only things that stopped during the past 24 hours were the air and missile attacks. Gang fire exchange continues at close range between groups of Houthis and the army in Haraf Sufyan and Al Malahid. Directions were given to the army, which is regrouping in several locations, not to shell locations unless they are attacked by the Houthis. Army and security units are combing their areas around Sada, searching for Houthi fighters, especially after the discovery of dormant cells in the old city of Sada. Attacks against neighboring areas around the city continue. Consequently, the military operations are focused on Bani Mu'ad and areas around Sada, which has been the target of Houthi attacks for the past two weeks. The Houthis wanted to take over the city and tried to stage a media attack against the Yemeni authorities. The new Iranian government has survived the votes of confidence in the parliament. Ahmadinejad has set next Sunday as the date for its first meeting. 
That was the morning news update from the Iranian capital, Tehran. After five days of negotiations and a one-hour session, the Iranian parliament approved the nominations of 18 out of 21 ministers. Among the well-known nominees approved by the parliament is Ahmed Wahidi, the new defense minister whose name is on Interpol's wanted list. Wahidi is implicated in the bombing of a Jewish center in Argentina. In addition, the parliament endorsed a female candidate, Marzia Wahid, for the Ministry of Health. She will be the first female minister in the history of the Islamic Republic. On the other hand, the Iranian parliament rejected the nominations of two female candidates for the ministries of education and social welfare. The parliament also rejected the nomination of Mohammad Ababi as Minister of Energy. Meanwhile, the Iranian president tried to capitalize on this news by sending a message to the outside world. In his message, Ahmadinejad condemned the possibility of imposing new sanctions on Tehran because of its nuclear program. He further said that his country wishes to resume negotiations with the world's superpowers, and it has submitted a new proposal regarding the issue. Ahmadinejad will likely reiterate his statement in New York City at the UN General Assembly meeting at the end of the month. Joining us from Tehran is our correspondent, Rida Al-Basha. Rida, do you think that Ahmadinejad has achieved what he wanted since he got the votes of confidence in parliament? Of course, I must say that the president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, pointed out before the session began that he was hoping that all of his ministers would be approved by the parliament. Ahmadinejad attempted to have his government be the first to receive the vote of confidence for all cabinet members, but this did not happen. Ahmadinejad did not achieve his goal because three of his ministers failed to receive the vote of confidence. Within three months, Ahmadinejad must select and introduce three new nominees to the parliament. Rida, the parliament granted the vote of confidence to one out of three women. Do you think that the radicals are still influencing politics in Iran? The approval of one female minister in the cabinet highlights the weakness of the extremists. The extremists want to prevent women from assuming positions in the cabinet. Today, one female candidate was selected to head the Ministry of Health, one of the most important positions in Iran. This proves that the radicals have failed to impose their views on the parliament since they only prevented two female candidates from being appointed. Well, after five days of heated debates, the Iranian parliament overwhelmingly gave the vote of confidence to most of the ministerial nominees proposed by President Ahmadinejad, as our Tehran correspondent Salman Kajuri now reports. The day of confidence vote finally arrived. After five days of debate over President Ahmadinejad's ministerial nominees, the lawmakers made their decision. They endorsed 18 of the 21 ministers proposed by Ahmadinejad as his new cabinet makeup. From among the three female ministerial nominees, Marzia Vahid Dasjerdi was the only woman who managed to garner enough votes to become Iran's first female minister. MPs rejected the two other women nominees and the proposed energy minister for lacking enough experience. Other high-profile ministers include Foreign Minister Manuchur Muteki, Oil Minister Masoud Mir Kazemi, Interior Minister Mohammad Mustafa Najjar, Defense Minister Ahmad Vahidi, Intelligence Minister Haider Muslihi, and Minister of Commerce, Mehdi Ghazanfari. Over the past couple of days, 128 MPs took the floor to either support or criticize the qualifications of the nominees. 
but finally they overwhelmingly supported the government's lineup. I still believe the ninth government was much stronger. Although I'm a critic of the government, I respect a final vote of confidence, but the ministers should bear in mind that if they have weak performance, they will be impeached. The overwhelming vote of confidence to the government means a crushing response to those who think the Iranian parliament and government are at odds. Ahmadinejad has now 15 days to propose new nominees for the energy, education and welfare ministries. With the parliament's approval of most nominees proposed to join the cabinet, it now seems that President Ahmadinejad will in the next four years put into practice his policies with less opposition from the parliament. Salman Kujuri, Press TV, Tehran. The heavy rains that occurred in the city of Nouakchott created flash floods that swept through several areas of the Mauritanian capital. As people became more vocal in their complaints, the authorities reiterated their plan to take several measures, including digging channels to drain the excess water from the capital. Here, in the middle of the capital, Nouakchott, the main streets have been transformed into water pools. Flash floods delayed the traffic and blocked the roads to places of work. Here in the upscale neighborhood of Tafrak Zena, there is a severe shortage of drainage channels. The wealth of this neighborhood did not spare it. Here in the neighborhood of Al-Basra, the flash floods added a new burden on the shoulders of residents who already suffer from severe poverty. We're hit by one flash flood after the other, but the city hasn't figured out a way to bring us dirt and keep the water away from us. We are drowning and have become displaced. We lost our homes, and we're asking people with a conscience to help the Mauritanian people overcome the crisis. The flash floods normally are met with a passive population and the failure of the authorities. However, some of the population of Sukhajin, which was surrounded by water from all sides, have tried to break this rule. Dozens of women from the neighborhood gathered outside the governor's office, demanding that the authorities save their families. The measures that we must take are to drain the water from all the places in the city of Nouakchott. There are vehicles with specialized septic pumps to drain the water. There are also other measures that can be taken simultaneously, such as transporting the citizens that were in the places that are suffering from the flood, and also to provide help to these citizens. The damages that are caused by the rains in Nouakchott include material destruction, such as destroyed simple residential homes and traffic delays. The most dangerous results pertain to the environment. Stagnant pools of water left by the rains are a suitable environment for the growth of many dangerous diseases. When talking about damages caused by flash floods, the residents of Nouakchott blame two things. First, the failure of consecutive governments to resolve the chronic problem of flash floods. Second, the location that was chosen to build Nouakchott may not be a suitable area for residential living. Hi, I'm John Hamilton, breaking in for just a few seconds to ask for your support. You know, television is expensive to produce, and while the team at Mosaic brings you this vital daily news program on a shoestring compared to other networks, the reality is that we still need to raise $200,000 to keep Mosaic strong till the end of the year. Well, each year at this time, we turn to you for that support. You haven't let us down before, so please, let's keep world news from the Middle East alive and strong for another year. You can give online at linktv.org or call us at 1-866-485-8848. And thanks so much for sustaining Mosaic on Link TV.
Iraqi Member of Parliament and Representative of the Accordance Front Noor al-Din al-Hayali warned against the deployment of joint forces in Iraq's disputed regions. The plan calls for the deployment of joint forces from the Iraqi army, the U.S. military and the Peshmerga. Al-Hayali said a plan like this will turn the region into an area similar to Darfur or Bosnia and Herzegovina. He also said that the deployment of foreign forces in the disputed regions violates the withdrawal agreement. Today, the Iraqi security forces in Baghdad uncovered a large cache of weapons, equipment and explosives in the area of Sabah Bur in Taji. The head of Baghdad operations, Major General Qasim Atta, said that the security measures and plans under the direction of the Iraqi army's chief of staff are undergoing changes regarding the redeployment of security forces in the provinces. Meanwhile, the Iraqi High Criminal Court resumed sessions in the trial of the defendants accused of quelling the Barzan uprising in 1993. The court listened today to the testimonies of more witnesses who talked about the catastrophic ordeal they faced at the hands of the former regime. تتوالى جلسات المحكمة الجنائية العراقية العليا التي تعقيدها بخصوص محاكمة The Iraqi High Criminal Court resumed sessions in the trial of key figures from the deposed regime. Today the court held a special session in the trial of the defendants accused of annihilating the Barzanis. The court listened to the testimonies of more witnesses who recounted the ordeals they faced under the unfair policies of the former regime. At 4 a.m. they raided our complex. They arrested every man they met. They didn't spare anyone and even arrested youth and the mentally disturbed. They arrested everyone and to date no one knows their whereabouts. Among the defendants implicated in the case is Ali Hassan al-Majid, also known as Chemical Ali, who received multiple death sentences in separate cases. Also standing trial is Tarek Aziz and several other key figures from the former regime, which violated the sanctity of the nation and its people. Our village is located in a remote area, which is about a seven-hour walk from the main street. The residents walked from the village to the main street in order to escape the shelling. Do you mean to say that they have destroyed the village and the convent? <laughs> Yes, they destroyed the village and the convent. They shelled it. It's worth mentioning that the Iraqi High Criminal Court has presided over a number of high-profile cases involving key figures from the former Iraqi regime, which ruled the country with an iron fist. أهلا بكم من جديد وبرنامج المحور من مدينة القدس المحتلة وحديثنا لهذا الأسبوع Welcome to the Mehwar or Axis program from Occupied Jerusalem. This week we will talk about the increase of Israeli settlements in Occupied Jerusalem. We welcome Professor Khalil Tafqiji, the head of the MAP Center in the Arabic Studies Department in Al-Quds University. First, why have settlements increased at this time? Several factors make it possible for Israel to increase settlements at this time. First, there is a right-wing Israeli government led by settlers, in particular Lieberman, who is a settler in the West Bank. Second, the municipality of Jerusalem is also led by right-wing officials. Third, the American guarantees that were given in 2004 to Sharon, who was the Prime Minister at the time. Fourth, Israel wants to create new facts 
troops on the ground to support Israel's position before the final status negotiation on Jerusalem. We have noticed that settlements have increased for the past two years. New settlements were built, others were expanded, and in some cases, new settlement units were built inside Palestinian neighborhoods. Israel wants Jerusalem to be only for the Israelis and does not want to share it with the Palestinians. Israel wants to make Jerusalem a center for Jewish civilization from all over the world. What are the most dangerous plans for this government and Israel in general pertaining to Jerusalem? All the Israeli plans are dangerous, but the most dangerous one is building settlement units inside Arab neighborhoods. This is what happened in the Damascus Gate inside the old city. Now Israel is trying to implement old plans by building new settlements in eastern Jerusalem. This plan was made in 1996, but it was postponed until now. However, during the recent municipal elections, the mayor promised to build these settlements in eastern Jerusalem, which we call the Eastern Gate. About 2,000 dunams were confiscated in this empty space between the wall and us. The land was taken from Isawiya, Anata, and Tur villages. The confiscation was done for three reasons. First, Israel wants to connect the Male Adumin settlements with the new settlement that will be built in this area. Second, Israel wants to surround Palestinian villages with a complete network of settlements which will be connected to each other. Third, it is known that Israel wants to build new settlements in order to change the demography in East Jerusalem to the advantage of Israel. In the areas between Malay Adumim and the French Hill, industrial areas will be built as well as residential units. Israeli spy Jonathan Pollard was not given due process by the American justice system. That's the conclusion of a report issued today by State Comptroller Michael Lindenstrauss. The report also concluded that a series of Israeli governments have worked continually and consistently for the release of imprisoned spy Jonathan Pollard. Most of the report remains classified and only a portion of the document was released today for publication. The report focused on government efforts to free Pollard, who was sentenced in 1987 to serve life in prison for spying on behalf of Israel. While researching the case, Lyndon Strauss and his team interviewed dozens of state officials, including former prime ministers, members of the cabinet, and the Pollard family. The retired judge found that prime ministers Netanyahu, Barak, Sharon, and Olmert, the Israeli governments consistently raised the issue in their meetings with U.S. presidents, as part of their efforts to secure Pollard's release. In an editorial comment, Lyndon Strauss wrote that the state of Israel owes Pollard the co commandment of redeeming prisoners and should continue to devote itself to obtaining Pollard's freedom. U.S. Middle East envoy George Mitchell says that he had a good meeting with Israeli officials last night in New York. Mitchell met with Prime Minister Netanyahu's envoy, Yitzhak Mocho, and Defense Minister El Barak's aide, Mike Herzog. The State Department said that Mitchell and the Israeli delegation reaffirmed their commitment to a comprehensive peace and concrete steps toward that goal. The meeting was a follow-up on Netanyahu's meeting with Mitchell in London last week. Settlement construction in the West Bank fell by a third in the first half of this year. New figures from the Central Bureau of Statistics show that Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria was down by 33 percent compared to 2008. Building starts dropped to 672 compared to 1,015. The U.S. is pressuring Israel to halt settlement construction entirely, and settlement leaders are using the new statistics as proof that a partial building freeze is already in place.
The sale of halal food in France has increased by 17 percent over the past few years. Halal products not only include meat, but other foods as well. Muslims in France were relieved to know that halal food is available, especially during the month of Ramadan, in which the demand for meat increases. We leave you with Tawfiq Ajali. French markets must make halal food available, especially during Ramadan, for a large Muslim community which exceeds 5 million. Halal foods can now be found throughout France. During the past years, the halal food market has increased by 17 percent. We estimate that the sale of halal food products has reached 4 billion euros in 2009. This is just the beginning. We notice, however, that there is a temporary increase during the month of Ramadan. Although all halal food is available, big food stores avoid displaying halal food products on shelves. Store owners feel that this is a sensitive issue. The problem is how to market halal food items to the Muslim community. Today, however, everything is available. We have ethnic media that helps us communicate with Muslim communities in France transparently and objectively. Although many food items are marked with the word halal, many Muslims in France question the halal qualifications of some of these products, especially in big food stores. Therefore, many French Muslims prefer to buy their halal meat from well-established butchers in the Muslim communities. We only buy halal food items from big food stores when we have no other choice. I do not buy meat from these big food stores. We do not know if the meat is really halal or not. The only guarantee we have is the word halal written on these products. According to specialists, the halal food market in France will represent 20 percent of the total French market in 2020. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.